My name is Scott Harrison. I'm a senior program manager at the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada, a not-for-profit organization focused on Canada-Asia relations. I'm also a research fellow at the Simon Fraser University's David Lamb Center. I'm airing from the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish peoples. Part of these lands is known as Vancouver, a city on the west coast of Canada in the province of British Columbia. I hope that by making such a territorial acknowledgement will help raise some curiosity for our viewers, regardless of where you may be, and take it upon yourselves to take a closer look at the history and contemporary situation of this part of Indigenous Canada. I also hope that you'll take the time to reflect on what a territorial acknowledgement and reconciliation might mean and look like in places where you work, live, play, and call home. And now for some housekeeping notes. Please note that this session is being recorded. Also, due to the large number of registrants, uh, we've disabled your cameras and microphones. So at any point along the line, if you wanna say hello or ask a question, please do so through the chat feature and the Q&A feature enabled at the bottom of your screen. Um, and we do welcome comments and questions throughout. We'll aim to get as many uh, questions as we can during the Q&A session at the end. If you don't have time to ask, have your uh, question responded to or, or answered during the session today, please do feel free to reach out and contact us. It should not need saying, but just in case, please keep comments and questions respectful. Also to make things feel as personal as possible, given the situation with, with Zoom that we're in, it would be a pleasure if you could enter into the chat where you are coming from, introduce yourself and say hello. And to help us navigate questions during our, our Q&A session at the end, we are delighted to have Cheyenne Connell with us on the webinar. Cheyenne is a graduate student at Simon Fraser University. So hello, Cheyenne, and thank you. So I'm delighted to be moderating this co-hosted session between Simon Fraser University's Dave Lamb Center and the Center for Ainu Indigenous Studies at Hokkaido University in Japan. At the center, this session is also a component of a Pan-Pacific Indigenous Studies speaker series in English that has been going on all week. In this co-hosted session, we are welcoming Professor Mai Ishihara to speak with us about invisible Ainu descendants in Hokkaido, Japan's northernmost island. So Dr. Ishihara completed her PhD in cultural anthropology at Hokkaido University in 2018, and she is now assistant professor at that university's Center for Ainu and Indigenous Studies. She has written many op-eds in newspapers, uh, received significant media attention, and her book just came out earlier uh, this month from Hokkaido University Press in Japanese titled Auto Ethnography of Silence, The Story of Pain of Silent Ainu and Their Care. So uh, on the session today, Dr. Ishihara will be giving about a 60 minute uh, or so presentation. After that, we will uh, break for five minutes, a uh, five minute refreshment break. When we return from break, uh, Dr. Sharda has asked me to provide a commentary on her talk. Following the commentary, we'll open up the floor uh, to questions from our audience. So, Ishihara Sensei, please take it away from here. Thank you very much for our wonderful introduction. And good afternoon in Canada and good morning in Japan. And hello to everybody. I see a lot of uh, comments and greetings on chat. So thank you very much. I enjoy reading that. Uh, first, I'd like to show my uh, sincere gratitude for the David Lum Center at Simon Fraser University and the wonderful staff who has been so who have been so supportive, which is uh, co-hosting this event. And Dr. Scott Harrison, who helped connect to Canadian audience for and everyone who came to hear my silent voice. So thank you very much. Okay, please let me share the slide. Okay, I am sharing the slide now. This research and the talk is for all the invisible persons and who are with silence and who feel I can't breathe. 
This means silent Ainu. Used to be me. Self-introduction. I was born and raised in Sapporo city. This is in Hokkaido, which is a northern part of Japan. My maternal grandmother was Ainu lady. This is an indigenous woman. Uh, this means a I know people are indigenous people, and she was an indigenous woman, but never said that in front of me in her entire in her entire life. On the other hand, my paternal grandmother was a descendant of Kotoni colonial troops. They are the leaders of settlers or colonizers. And I have studied in the US in junior high school, that was only a short stay, and high school, that was a year. After graduating from, from university, I became an English teacher. I worked at high school and, um, sorry, it was um, professional college. And I went to graduate school at the age of 28 and doctorate at age 36. And I became an assistant professor at Hokkaido University Center for Ainu and Indigenous Studies from October, 2020. And today's talk, I like to introduce the multicultural situation in Japan and learn together why people with diverse backgrounds in Japan, including those with Ainu indigenous heritage, are silent. Silence does not occur only by hiding, but also absence of words, speech, and exclusion of the third domain. I would also like to introduce autoethnography and talk about the effectiveness in enriching global society. I would like to mention two things to begin with. One is the case of discriminatory comment made against the Ainu people on a morning infotainment TV program. On March 12, when introducing a documentary featuring Ainu women, the comedian TV show host said, quote, this is a quote from a Japan, Japanese news program apologizes for calling Ainu dogs of unseen Japan by Andrew Kia. I will now tell a riddle. What is something you'd say when you watch this segment? And also when you see an animal, a inu. The joke is a popular form of riddle in Japanese known as nazokake, where two seemingly unrelated topics are connected by using wordplay. In this case, the name Ainu was connected to the phrase a inu, which is a, a dog, which sounds familiar. Unfortunately, it's also a common phrase used to comp uh, compare the indigenous group to animals and de dehumanize them, end quote. The Nippon TV and comedian and people involved immediately apologized. They also said they would work to prevent a uh, recurrence. While we can evaluate this whole process to a certain extent, I'd like to mention one point that was left out. That is the existence of people who are still crying today. Even right now at this very moment, without anyone knowing about it. We need to know about people who are left behind. This may be very hard because these people are usually invisible. And when they speak out, they are really hard. As Gayatri Spivak, whom I really admire, said, it is very difficult to hear or to reach the voice of subaltern. A friend of mine told me about a comment that was very crushing. This is another thing, and it's the, it is the Twitter of hate. It said, there is also the idea of eating and offering. You can use the human remains, I use human remains, add soup stock and make ramen. There is a lot of know-how in Sapporo. So this was Twitter saying, Sapporo ramen is famous, so there are joking, jokes in it. I hope there will be a law to regulate such comments that kill the people's heart, but I see no future in discussing the morality of this person who said this comment, just as the fact that the person with strong exclusionist tendencies ran for election and won 180,000 votes. And as the Japanese sociologist Naoto Higuchi had shown in his writings, exclusionism, exclusionism situation in Japan may be a patholo pathological, normal, and part of normal democracy. 
And the second thing I would like to share is the painful and hopeful memory and present. The director of the Center of Fine and Indigenous Studies issued the following statement. You can take a look at this on our web page. It says, Hokkaido University is located on the land that the Ainu people have inherited from their ancestors. We need to consider and recognize seriously our history as an institution of higher education, which was established as a forerunner of, the, of colonization policy and turned Hokkaido into a domestic colony. This was the director's statement. I recall a few years ago when I was involved in organizing the National Conference of an Academic Society at Hokkaido University. The planning section of the conference was named Reconsidering Colonialism and the Constitution in Hokkaido, Ainu Moshri. Ainu Moshri means the land of Ainu. When people saw this title, several researchers warned me that I'd not be able to find a job if I did this kind of thing. Using the word colonialism and questioning the constitution seemed not to be a good idea to uh, certain people in Hokkaido and beyond. As predicted by some of these researchers, it was very difficult for me to earn an income from academic work even after I received my PhD. I need to thank my very good friend who is a Maori person and junior associate professor, uh, Matthew Kaure of Hokusei Kakuen Junior College, who gave me a chance to teach at university for the first time in my life. When I recall these experiences, the statement by director of our center I just mentioned is very powerful for me, making me feel that it is finally okay to be alive. Last October, I became the first female researcher in the history of Hokkaido who is openly indigenous women. I will discuss the generation situation in Japan later, but I am also the first woman, whether indigenous or not, to be employed as a full-time faculty member at the Center for Ainu and Indigenous Studies, where I'm currently working. There are many aspects of background on silence of which I'm going to share a story. This is the book I just, um, just came out. The title is, um, Autoethnography of Silence, the story of the pain of silent Ainu and their care. So my persuasion and the question was, uh, what is silence? What, why are we silent? Why do I lose my words? Why did I have to live in a history of non-inheritance? What prevent me from weaving words? How can I reach the pain of the forgotten and defeated? So in the cover of the book, it says, uh, absent words overflowing. A German philosopher, Arthur Schopenhauer, once said, we forfeit three-fourths three of ourselves in order to be like other people. But my question is, what happens when you realize that there is an important me inside the me you forfeited? So this book and my research is a story about me who lived from the age of 12 to 36 as an invisible person, trying to weave words from an absent world with absent words, and through repeated setbacks, re revealing the story around me, the world, the history and culture, part of humanity, and realizing the potential of words, speeches, and also its violent nature. So now I'd like to share the um, prologue from my book, I tried it to translate into English for this talk. The I struggles in silence. The silence whose contours are formed by hiding, absence of words, and the exclusion of the third domain decomposes in my eternal internal organs of day by day, under my, my heart, body, and life. I struggle, drown, and die. With structures, justice, and order, silence cannot be born into the world as a historical consequence. Violently, violently given misplaced words, the pain of the silence destroys the body. It is not necessarily malice that creates silence. The structures and orders that trigger the formation of any community contain their own classification systems. The classification system is manifested as words, and the words produce silence, as if light and darkness are insepar inseparable. 
Thus, if silence is born as we humankind invented one of the greatest invention, language, speech, words, and an essential part of the human society, then we must set silence as the essential problematic of humanity. It is said that my maternal grandmother was an Ainu woman. 150 years have passed since the Ainu land was named Hokkaido, and even though I have recovered economically and socially, I still feel the pain of losing my life. When I was told about my Ain origins of the age of 12, I hid this fact from myself. As long as I didn't mention it, I could live my life as an ordinary Japanese. When I became an adult, I finally could no longer endure the cloak of silence. However, I have no words to speak from silence. This was because I did not have the experience of living as an Ainu, as an Ainu, did not know what had happened, was invisible in history, and did not have the opportunity to speak. And now I have finally acquired words from silence. However, the words will never reach anyone due to the exclusion of the third domain. Even if I come out, even if I acquire words, even if I say words, the silence lasts forever. One of my paternal origin is from the Kotoni colonial troops. The Kotoni colonial troops were the pioneer leaders of the ICE people who were defeated in the battle of the end of Edo period and moved from Aizu to Tonami, northern part of mainland of Japan, and some of them settled in Hokkaido. The Ainu were socially exterminated and the pioneer leaders who socially exterminated the Ainu. The stories of both are not imprinted on my existence. Why does I not have a history? Why is it that my mother, grandmother, and my maternal relatives continue to show an air of sadness and faintness, but are unable to resolve it? I was being chased by a question that no book had the answer to, and I could not continue to run away from it. And the age of 34, I was in the middle of the ring of history and society. When a turning point came to me through the ancestral human remains of Ainu. On July 14, 2016, a symposium entitled The Significance of Returning the Ainu Ancestral Human Remains and Research Ethics for a Heartfelt Return was held at Hokkaido University. On the following day, 12 ancestral human remains were returned from Hokkaido University to the plaintiffs of the Ainu people in the lawsuit for the return of the remains, followed by a two-day ritual ceremony in Kineoskotan, Urakawa town. I participated in the four-day event with my mother and my mother's cousin. In 1978, Kaibazawa Hiroshi came to an office of Anutari Ainu, We Human Beings, which was published by young Ainu people to make a proposal on the issue of Ainu, Ainu sorry, issues of Ainu. 43 years have passed since then. Susumu Emori, a historian, described the return of the ancestral human remains as the first time that the Ainu people have won their own demands. The ancestral re human remains brought out from the ossuary at Hokkaido University were different from the bones that had lived a normal life. When I see a box the size which only contains a skull, my heart is torn. I wonder where the body had gone. The Ainu people who were suddenly and unilaterally incorporated into Japanese society at the start of the Meiji era, and the establishment of Kaitakushi Development Bureau must have been deprived of their culture, trampled down, and somehow ended their difficult lives. Some Ainu may have regretted their birth because of the suffering they endured. Even in death, however, even their bodies were mutilated and their skulls and bodies were kept separate for decades in a dark, uninviting Ainu ossuary in a corner of a parking lot 
of the Hokkaido University School of Medicine, depriving them of their dignity. Having suffered this fate, I wondered if the Ainu, who might have regretted their birth, also regretted their death. I knew that there was an Ainu Osiri there from the time I entered the Graduate School of Hokkaido University. I even passed by it on occasion. Books on the Ainu people have written about the history of Ainu ancestral human remains. And from time to time, I have had the opportunity to read news reports about the repatriation issues. I have even heard the voice of the bereaved families whose ancestral human remains were taken from them. However, I had never given my heart to them housed there. Who took the Ainu skulls from the village and left them there for decades? Are Japanese physical anthropologists such as Sakuzaima Kodama, Yoshikiyo Kogane, and others entirely responsible for this? The remains must have been unhappy that they were dug up, dug up from the graves and used as specimens while their flesh was still there from being buried in the ground. But what is more and is sad is that they have been buried in the oblivion of history. All there is left is a silence that carries pain and sorrow. The ancestral human remains of the Ainu have been in a dark and sad place for a long time. They have been dying over and over again. The time moves at an unprecedented speed. The sun rises and sets. Spring turns to summer, autumn, winter, and spring again. And it passes like there's no time to blink. In this change in times, who has continued to forget the sorrow of the pain? and the pain of the Ainu remains. The existence and the pain of oblivion, oblivion is pondered and silenced. There are still more than 100 Ainu, more than 100 Ainu remains waiting for release and redemption in their place. The silence of the Ainu remains is overlaid with the silence of I, the remains have grabbed me and will not get, let go. And they keep screaming. Don't forget, weave words from silence. And heal, heal, heal. The cries of the Ain, him, Ain remains grow louder every day. In the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, in dreams, in hope, in dis despair. At least I can't expect, escape, escape the cries of them with no history imprinted, imprint, imprinted on my body. I needed something in order to regain my story. It was, without a doubt, my pain. And it was also the pain of the ancestral human remains that kept screaming. The silent remains in for me. My pain which has never been spoken of, which has never been noticed, which has never existed in history and society, was certainly there. Silence was not defeat. I would weave a story of pain. Silence is not nothingness, nor it is absence. Silence is a creative possibility. Weaving words out of pain of silence will surely give words to the various pain that are not yet there and open the way to a future that has never been imagined before. The journey to silence begins here and now. Now, I would like to introduce some uh, current Ainu situations. First, according to a survey conducted by Hokkaido government in um, 2017, the annual population of Hokkaido was a bit over 13,000, based on the number of those who identify themselves as Ainu. Some assume that there could be around 100,000 people who have Ainu heritage across Japan and beyond, 
but they are often invisible and silent or do not know their heritage, so they remain, remain inaccessible. I used to be one of them. In Canada, there may be many issues surrounding multiculturalism. However, I think it is the country where multiculturalism is most discussed in the world. What I have learned about ethnic racial situation in Canada from the Canadian census is described next. Well, this is from a 2016 census. In 2016, over 250 ethnic origins or ancestries were reported by Canadian population. Four in 10 people reported more than one origin. British Isles and French origins are still among the most common in 2016. However, their share in the population has decreased considerably since the 1871 census. In 2016, close to 20 million people reported European origins. Chinese ancestry, 1.8 million people. East Indian ancestry, approximately 1.4 million people. And Filipino ancestry, 8, 8 137,130 people are among the 20 most common ancestry reported among the Canadian population. 2.1 million people or 6.2% of the total Canadian population reported having Aboriginal ancestry. Next, let's look at the Japanese census. In order to develop a nationwide policy for the Ainu people, the first prerequisite side is to obtain basic information on the Ainu population, geographical distribution, and other necessary data. The Ainu Policy Office of the Cabinet Secretariat would like to see the Ainu population added to the national census. Despite a re request to add a section on ethnic groups to the census, this was never done. The response was next. In order to set up response options for ethnic groups, it is necessary to classify each ethnic group based on a certain definition. However, defining each ethnic group is a delicate matter, matter, and no official definition for classification has been established in Japan yet. Moreover, it is difficult to say that most of the people living in Japan know that ethnic group, what ethnic group they belong to. In addition, it is difficult to imagine how to confirm this, so there are concerns about whether it's possible to ensure correct entry. In addition, setting up a survey item specifically for the Ainu people would result in its limited use. Furthermore, it may lead to unnecessary criticism that the survey is discriminatory. Number of Ainu people ascertained by survey is, as I mentioned, 13,000. 118 in 2017. Multicultural Situation in Japan by Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications, building a new normal by realizing a diverse and exclusive, inclusive uh, society, accepting foreign civilians as members of the local community and creating an environment for human interaction connection and mutual support, thereby realizing a diverse and inclusive society and building a new normal for the post-corona uh, era. So um, there's no ethnicity section in the Japanese census. Also, how Japanese Minister of Internal Affairs and Communication see multicultural situation is only about foreigners. Sorry. One more thing. Japanese historian of UCLA, Katsuya Hirano, explains how the colonial process was achieved and points out that the process of breeding social difference and heterogeneity as delayed, barbaric, and unexploited, and institutionalizing it is one of the domain, dominant strategy of any imperialist or colonial system. Hirano recalls it, Hirano calls it, colonial translation. In order to promote modernization, the Japanese state created an ideal subject, the Japanese people, and at the same time, positioned Ainu as a subject that had failed to become a subject, driving them to a brink of extinction. In the process of the Ainu being incorporated as a nation and being authorized within a community, language and literature were rescued. However, racial prejudice against the Ainu people came to be hidden in the real 
visibility. This is um, the quotation from Kinase Takashi. So um, this problematic area is on the same plane as a critical multiculturalism, which encompasses a critic of liberal multiculturalism and corporate multiculturalism. Furthermore, what is Japanese is not a simple question. In Konketsu no Nihonjin, Half Double Mix no Shakaishi, this, uh, the translation is Mixed Blood and Japanese, a social history of half, doubles, and mixes. The author question, an old and new question, what is Japanese? It is absolutely important for indigenous people to inherit their traditional culture. However, in seeking the restoration of human rights, it would not be decolonization for if indigenous people only seek the right to practice their traditional culture, especially in a nation which perpetuate invisible racism. From understanding only those cultures such as fashion, food, and festivals, which calls like a cosmetic multiculturalism, that do not evoke uh, inconvenience to the majority, there will be no progress step by step toward understanding racism in colonial history. I would like to emphasize that this perspective is particularly important in the future discussion on multiculturalism in Japan. When I came out that I have Ain background or heritage, I was told that Ain culture is wonderful and while cultural differences were assumed, I was also told that Ain are the same as Japanese and my differences were neutralized, or I was othered by Japanese based on my 25% origin of blood, we need to think more about the strange exclusion and inclusion. 2019, there was a 150th anniversary of the naming of Hokkaido, and there were um, two significant laws to mention. Uh, that one is 1998, 1997, Ainu Cultural Promotion Act, and 19, sorry, 2019 Ainu Policy Promotion Act. In a social context that values only a single image of an Ainu, it is difficult to imagine the people who were forced to assimilate in the colonial past. In Japanese exclusionism that is becoming increasingly serious in Japan, it is said that Ainu have already have been completely assimilated into Japan due to the fact that the Ainu people do not practice their traditional culture. Back in August 20. 14, Yasuki Kaneko, an assemblyman in support, posted a comment on Twitter saying the indigenous Ainu group no longer exists and suggested that those who identify as Ainu are motivated by government programs that benefit the ethnic minority. The present law does not encompass anything may legally confirm the term Ainu. This was in 2014. And Kaneko claimed that state support, including scholarship and low interest housing loans, are why people claim to be Ainu and question if there are any Ainu peoples who live using Ainu language. Katsushi Abe, vice executive director of the Ainu Association of Kaido, challenged Kaneko's comment. I feel disgusted with his lack of knowledge. It was regretful seeing this image effort to restore the lights of Ainu people, Abe said. This debate wasn't surprising to me, as we keep hearing people say, where, I, where are Ainu people? Have you ever seen Ainu people before? Even school teachers never seem to realize that there are actually Ainu descendants in their classroom. But at the same time, I never met anyone who identified himself or herself as Ainu while I was at school in Sapporo. The Ainu lived for centuries in Hokkaido and nearby Sakhalin and Creel Island. But the Japanese government only recently passed a bill recognized the Ainu as indigenous people who have their own language, religion, and culture. Here, no consideration is given to racism. The reason for this is that for Japanese, racism is, some, racism is considered to be an issue between black people and white people. However, there is still a strong aspect a discrimination against the Ainu people, resident Korean and Chinese living in Japan, and black people in terms of marriage. This is a form of racism that discriminates on the basis of blood or origin. Because racism and colonialism in Japan are not socially accepted, sensible, sensible intellectual people seek only to restore 
not only intelligent, but um, the people who are so sensitive, people seek only to uh, restore traditional culture, while xenophobes uh, try to unilaterally include the Ainu people again based on absence of traditional culture. And there is another thing I would like to share. As the legal scholar Mark Levin Riley pointed out, Japan's dynamic are fluid and complex. The introduction of critical race theory in Japan is still sufficient. Levin also noted that Japan's Wajin dominant racial discourse represents the epitome of majority race transparency. And that for some Wajin, Wajin is the term to uh, indicate non ainu Japanese. I still think that um, we need to discuss, we need to have a, a deep discussion about these terms, but I'm using it now. Um, for some Wajin, the extraordinary degree of racial transparency beyond that of whites in the US may leave them unaware of even the race-based social boundaries and minority subordination subordination exists in Japan, or at least profoundly unaware of many painful realities. So decolonization in Japan academia is thus a difficult endeavor on multiple levels, and in light of the internal fragmentation of Ainu people since the Ainu Culture Promotion Act, the creation of indigenous-led ethical debates and information management mechanisms must also face various difficulties. Until now, Research and surveys on the Ainu people have clarified issues related to cultural inheritance, welfare, and identity. However, the reality of people who do not speak has been difficult to survey and has remained unexplored. What I have been trying to do is to describe another post-colonial situation in Hokkaido that has never been revealed by even together diachronic family histories and my stories of my of my stories in coeval social situations. I would like to describe the post-colonial situation of colonized in the following way. What is taken away remains taken away. For me, all the unresolved pain that comes with having an heritage is caused by something that remains stolen. I don't resolve that pain with alternatives. I thought about the source of the pain of the brink of the life. Let's call this one example of decolonization. Now, let me introduce some uh, Japanese situation of um, women. Japanese feminist Chizuko Ueno, Japan's most famous feminist and female sociologist, made a stirring speech at the University of Tokyo's entrance ceremony in April 19, 2019, in which spoke about the deep-rooted discrimination against women in Japanese society. She said, the percentage of female students admitted to the University of Tokyo has not been over the 20% barrier for a long time. The percentage of female students in under undergraduate program is about 20%, but in graduate programs, the percentage rises to 25% in master's programs and 30.7% in doctoral programs. Beyond that, the percentage of women in research position drops to 18.2% for assistant professors, 11.6 point percentage for associate professors, and 7.8 percentage for professors. This is lower than the ratio of female members of the diet. There is only one female dean out of 15, and none of the past presidents has been a woman. And she also mentioned about uh, noble Peace Prize uh, Laureate Malala Yousafzai's father when asked how he raised his daughter and replied, I've tried not to break her wings. And Ueno said, that's right, many of daughters have had their wings broken, which every child, child has. And she also said, I'm sorry for making you to live in this world. Tizuko Wen's comments are very encouraging and give us a better understanding of what kind of society we are being silenced in. Unfortunately, in her reference to the, uh, to the right to self-determination, 
and uh, party sovereignty, the she did not include the issue of ethnic or racial minorities. And another thing I would like to introduce is this uh, Japanese word or Japanese culture. And I think this was very, very significant. And it just happened uh, last month. I call this as wakimaeru incident. I put the Japanese word also, wakimaeru. And as um, Japanese cultural anthropologist Chie Nakane once said, Japan is a vertical society. There are many cultures in Japan that illustrate this um, vertical society, which is one example is a senpai kohai culture. It's a high hierarchical relationships. So it's about high status and low status. In Japan, um, especially in a school, even in college or university, it's really important to know who is older. Even one year older, one year, one year difference is really a big um, difference because this senpai kohai culture. And also, there are very complex uh, language system, which is um, respectful language. It's called as uh, sonkeigo and humble language. This is a kenjogo. For example, um, the word look can be like miru, just a casual casual um, way, and sonkeigo goran ninaru. And humble language, uh, sorry, respectful language, it's called, it will be like goran ninaru, and the humble language will be like haiken suru. So when the subject is the other person, use respectful language. If you're the subject, you should use humble language. It means you put yourself down. So there are completely different uh, words for every, um, for many words. And another thing, there was this, um, well, this Wakimaeru incident come from the um, Tokyo Olympic chief Mori sexist comments. He used this word uh, to talk about his team in his uh, Tokyo Olympic Committee. What he said, I put the, um, the link to the article, but what he said was um, when women in the, are in the meeting, the meeting has to be longer. And that was, that was, and, and in, that, in that comment, he used this wakimaeru. It can, I checked that in how we can say it in English, but I don't think there is any word for this wakimaeru. So it can be like knowing where you are, your position with reading between lines. And this reading between lines means be, read between Mori's lines or um, men, older men, it's line. And this key phrase, uh, hashtag wakimai nai, nai is a negative form. So um, wakimai nai, women is shaking the world. This was an article. So Mori, um, yes, this is something I like to share. So this is a Japanese um, society we are living in. <clears throat> Okay, and um, at the same time, after this Wakimae Teiru incident, there are many women and many people are um, issue, issued comments and certificate psychologist and clinical, clinical psychologist Sayoko Nobuta was one of them. She said, in fact, even in a same-sex group, when a younger participant speaks up, the older boss may look at her, him, and say, she or he doesn't know what she is or he is talking about. She's or he is not being wakimaeteiru. The most of his hierarchical, hierarchical relationship is discrimination against women. It may be rare in Asian countries that, uh, well, she also said, it may be a rare in Asian countries that male politicians in their 70s and above in the ruling party speak out based on male-centered values without hesitations. While the momentum for the elimination of all forms of discrimination has become the norm in developed countries.
So, how about in Japan? There is a currently no women on the board of directors of Hokkaido University. Not even one woman, female. Of course, there has never been a female president in, the, in our university's history. As I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, I am the first full-time female faculty member of the Center for Ainan and Business Studies in Hokkaido of Hokkaido University since it was established in 2007. Furthermore, I am the first person in history to become a full-time faculty member at the university, at least in Hokkaido, who has disclosed uh, the indigenous heritage. And so far, I am the only one female. As a female, I'm the only one. As Japanese anthropologist, cultural anthropologist Kwayama, Ta Kwayama Takami noted once in his book, uh, native anthropology in reference to the world system of knowledge. There is a center and a periphery in the academic world. This refers to a structure in which people who are positioned in the periphery are not accepted by the center, no matter how good their research is. This discussion of center and periphery is suggestive of how, of how my voice as a woman and as an indigenous person has been unknowingly killed in Hokkaido not in Tokyo, as a woman, not as a man, as a person of indigenous origin, not as a non-indigenous indigenous majority, and not as an indigenous woman, oh, sorry, an, an indigenous woman, not an indigenous man. So there are multiple peripheries um, of this silence. Am I doing okay with time? Now, I would like to share my family history and my autoethnography. My great grandmother, Tsuru, had a tattoo around her lips and lived in a traditional culture. My grandmother, Chiako, started to work in a Wajin run farm when she was only eight. She never tried to practice any other culture after that. She was trying very hard to become Japanese because she thought that was the only way to survive and succeed economically in Japanese society. She decided to marry a Wajin, non ainu majority Japanese, ethnic majority Japanese man, so as to reduce the percentage of Ainu blood. My great grandmother Tsuru was born in 1904, and she grew up in an indigenous village with tattoo, and when she went outside the indigenous village, she had to cover her tattoo with a rag. When children saw an Ainu, old Ainu woman, they would make fun of her and tease her Ainu. The discriminatory gaze of the children reflected that of the adults. In such a history, Tsuru was not allowed to speak. And this is about my grandmother Tsuyako having experienced the economic disparity between herself and Wajin. Tsuyako was convinced that she, the most important thing for survival was the economy. She was born in um, 1925 and forced to work in a non Ainu Japanese farmhouse from the age of eight. eight. And sometimes she had to eat uh, rotten rice and she completely and it's rather unnaturally avoided Ainu culture. And I was really close to my grandmother, but she never even uttered a word Ainu in entire, entire her life. And what she conscious was um, becomes Japanese. And now this is about my mother. My mother, Itsuko, didn't inherit any Ainu culture, but racially, she was treated Ainu, as Ainu. Even with one drop of blood back then, people were recognized as Ainu in her village. She was involved with the Ainu movement and published newspapers about Ainu issue, but she felt an emptiness. Itsuko was born and raised in Biratori, where many Ainu people live, but she did not inherit Ainu culture. 
The fact that she did not have Ainu culture while being identified as Ainu brought internal division to her. In her 1970s newspaper of young Ainu people titled Anutari Ainu, she tried to explain what it means to be Ainu and what it means to be human, but it ends in frustration for her. Society has not changed and her narrative has not reached the Ainu. This experience of frustration caused Isko to become silent. So let's call this the absence of words. And these are the words I have been told. So this kind of motivated me to write autoethnography. It said, your pain is no big deal. But if we prioritize pain, it will be hard for people to say they are in pain. So I decided to write. If, and I was also told, if you don't choose to be Ainu, become Japanese. But as discrimination in marriage shows, as long as there is discrimination against Ainu blood or origin, it is not easy to become Japanese unless a person remain in silence. And don't worry about it. You're obsessing too much. It is not up to someone to decide whether the person in pain or with silence cares or worries or not. Your Ainu usually live as Ainu. What about other history cities? You're Japanese, not Ainu. Ainu must be Japanese. What about my Ainu history city? That's not research, you're wrong. The framework, the framework of research has failed to clarify the historicity of the silent Ainu. Why is it so easy for someone who is not the person to the, to the issues to simply say that is wrong? I couldn't take it any longer, so I started to weave my words. I was born and have lived a continuation, continuation of silence of Tulu. Teako and Itko. Silence in family creates a loss of story. In a life where I have lived with a family or darkness in my heart, what I have had is not our story, but our pain. The silence between the generations of my family has caused a vertical division, which in turn has caused a horizontal division with other Ainu. My mother and very close relatives never even uttered the word I knew to each other. When I was 12, I saw my mother was raising her voice as she was talking to her cousin and said, I told my husband's family about my minjoku. It was a very strange occasion to see my mother talking like that, and I didn't understand the meaning of minjoku, so I asked her later what she meant by minjoku. She asked, do you really want to know? Want to regret to hear it? And she told me that my grandmother was Ainu lady. However, my mother says, I am Ainu person, but I am not a member of Ainu Mintoku. Many have uh, per preconceived ideas of Ainu people as those who practice traditional culture, but most Ainu people don't practice it any, any longer. What does it, what does it to be mean to be an Ainu person then? I must say it was very shocking for me to discover my Ainu heritage. I have no Ainu, Wajin, or Japanese father whose ancestor was among the Kotoni colonial troops, which was the first group of Japanese people to settle and develop the island of Hokkaido. I assumed I had never met Ainu people until then without knowing my heritage. I didn't, I don't identify myself. I didn't identify myself as Ainu, but people never accepted my explanation and just treat me as Ainu. People tell me that I am refusing my identity or searching for my identity. The more Ainu people I met, the more excluded I felt. It is not just about my identity issue, but the social structure that makes me feel very uncomfortable to live with. I need to know why people never try to hear my voice. I started a journey stretching back to the late 19th century to trace 150 years of my family history in order to get back the story and history of my own. What has only been inherited through my family in the past 150 years is the effort and sentiment of not being Ainu. For my ancestors, that was the only strategy to survive in Japanese society. But invisible racism in Japan doesn't allow Ainu descendants to become completely Japanese. This made us silent and invisible. Are we, not, we are not completely Ainu, but we are not ethnic, ethnic, ethnically Japanese either. There is official Ainu history in Japanese history, but these are not our, my history. 
in Japan, especially in Hokkaido, it's very clear one is officially either Aino or Wajin, but there's no category for what I call silent Aino. Reclaiming what remains stolen, what I have tried to do was to recapture history in present. It is what Walter Benjamin once called those waiting to be awakened. In the background of our family's inability to talk about our origins, there was a time when Tsuru and Tsuyako had difficulty surviving in Japanese society as Ainu and did not compass, of, compass on any of their stories to their children. It's cause experience and the rejection of Ainu culture. What was lost in the process was the history of the family and their own voices and words during the 100 years when even the word Ainu was thriftily avoided. It was possible to live as Chinese, to live as Japanese in a Japanese society in exchange for silence, but at the same time, it caused unspeakable pain and division in the family. It was the process that gave rise to our respective subalterns. So I was obsessed with my existence, which seemed ambiguous to others, because I wanted to imprint the history of my Ayn grandmother, who had risked her life denying everything of her background and way of life as Ayn to survive. And at the same time, I didn't want to erase my, my other background of settlers. This was to carve out a way of life for myself so that I could breathe naturally. I have been working on theories and methodology not to prove my existence, but rather to eliminate hitherto unrevealed social structures and histories, and for the recognition of invisible people and silence. Referring to debate on the politics of representations that have been subject of cultural anthropology and social anthropological classification theories, I represent a theory and methodology that incorporates the world of middle boys proposed by Japanese philosopher Koichiro Kokubun and Todisha studies and combines them with the theory of autoethnography. I insist that silence is not a defeat, rather it is creation of in, and hope of the future world. There are three types of silence in my book, hiding, and absence of words, speech, and exclusion of the third domain. Hiding occurs in, in the same time, in the time when living as indigenous people was a stigma. This was the time of our, our grandmother and great grandmothers. As social understanding advances, people began to speak out, but it was difficult to find the words, find the words to do so. Let's call this the absence of words speech. This is what my mother experienced. What I experienced in the era of diversity and right restoration was a phenomenon in which the majority and the Ayn side, in order to protect their own order and community, excluded anom anomalies, people like as the third domain. The nature of silence is very complex and diverse. So I spent 10 years to finish this research and it um, resulted in autoethnography. What I have in mind from this experience is these words. From transparent non-indigenous and one-colored indigenous to colorful non-indigenous and colorful indigenous. I would like to conclude this talk with epilogue from my book. It is the hope of silence creation and violence. We human beings invented language, homo sapiens, though fragile as individuals, communicated through language, created stories, religions, and fictions. And by connecting as we reigned su supreme over the earth, language is not only a tool for domination. We can use words to speak of love, friendship, and hope. It is through words that I ponder silence and thus structure my questions. Language is one of the greatest inventions of mankind, but let us remember that darkness is separable from light, blankness from space, 
silence from sound, speech, words, and silence from words. Each of them cannot exist on its own. Through the act of looking, we continue to create blind spots. And through the act of speaking, we continue to create silence. In 19, uh, sorry, in 2019, 150 years have passed since Iron Land was named as Hokkaido. Hokkaido is now celebrating the 150th anniversary. People, including my father's side of the family, who worked hard to develop, develop Hokkaido with a frontier spirit, went through tremendous hardship, and my present life is based on the hardship of these people. However, while the story of developing is emphasized and the hardship of the settlers are engraved in it, I would like to focus on something that has been forgotten. This is the pain of the silence of the Ainu people who have lived for the past 150 years, the convict laborers who were used and abandoned like slaves for the de development of Hokkaido, and the people who have yet to be seen. In this beautiful land, I like to remember their history of losers. Now, each of these nameless stars lost the race to write history and are now silent. I want to remember the Ain people who are once self-reliant and lived a rich life with a wonderful spiritual world. We also need to remember the people who died in the shadow of Hokkaido's development, including the thought criminals of the time. We would like to remember them now. The Ainu were suddenly incorporated into, Jap into the nation as Japanese. This sudden cultural genocide was one of the greatest tragedies of all. Many Ainu died in despair. I congratulate Tsuru, Tsuyako, and Itsuko for surviving. It took the pessimism and lamentations of the Ainu and many other non-forgotten people including Japanese and foreigners, for history to lead my life. I have all this and I'm still alive. If I had not been mentioned my Ainu origins, heritage, I could have lived an ordinary life. However, I just couldn't live without my beloved grandmother's origins. At the same time, I knew that I could not live my life as an Ainu. The order and structure surrounding me the Ainu can only provide for both. Desperately wanting to imprint my grandmother's history on my existence, I weaved words from silence. The realm of silence is taboo in society, an anomaly and chaos. Let's take this as the third domain. The order and structure of society is established by eliminating this third domain. Therefore, Silence is an element that establishes order and structure. But it is also an area that is prevented from being made visible. My act of weaving words out of silence is violence in the sense of that is uh, shakes, order and structures. I finally know why my presence is not welcomed, not acknowledged, and my words are not heard. If I am the third domain, I have been standing at the crossroads of whether to live with exclusion and silence or to use violence to create cracks in the order and structure. What am I? Why am I unilaterally labeled as Ainu or not Ainu? Why can't I talk about Ainu with my family and relatives? Why do I have to remain silent about my beloved grandmother's heritage origins? My, uncom un my uncontrollable emotion drove me to journey into the silence and the stories that had been given away. There I encountered the strength of those who continue to live and the pain of silence. I am grateful to Ruth, Yako, and Itsuko for giving birth to their children, nurturing them, and passing them on my generation. Despite the hopelessness of their situation and despite the fact that they're Ainu families were divided. 
Tsuru probably did not allow Tsuyako to inherit Ainupuri. This is a traditional um, indigenous way of living actively, hoping that she would somehow survive in Japanese society. What the dying race discourage promotes in the Ainu themselves in the idea that if they die as a race, they can achieve a position of equality with the majority. This included their own ancestry and history. Tsuyako wanted Itsuko to be equal to the Japanese and try to make her avoid all things about Ainu. The price for Itsuko and me of being able to live as Japanese was to leave our history and stories behind, to forget them, to be silent about them. We have been living the history of Hokkaido in silence and pain, having lost our history and stories through the divisions of our families. Another post-colonial situation, which has never been discovered before, now appears in front of us. The opportunity for a family to meet again came, up, came from the Ainu ancestral human remain housed in Hokkaido University Ainu Ossery. I would like to repeat the words of the prologue. The remains have wrapped me and will not let go. And they keep screaming, don't forget, weep words from silence and heal, heal, heal. I finally realized that there is silence, another story, another pain. It wasn't just a non Ainu Japanese who had forgotten the pain of the Ainu remains and who had silenced them. It was me, myself. People with Ainu heritage origins are no longer able to feel the pain and sorrow of the Ainu remains as their own. This present situation is not only the result of any individual, not only the result of any individual group decision on the part of either the Ainu or Japanese, the present situation was created by the violence inherent, inherent in humanity and the silence that is inseparable from humanity's greatest invention language. Even now, the remains of the Ainu continue to appeal to us about this history of silence. My mother Itsuko says, I am very weak and imperfect person, but to me, she is a small giant. Her unspeakable core is so strong and resilient, and her way of living while accepting great talo is very touching. In the background, there is a story of how Tsuyako and Tsuru never gave up her and survived. My grandmother Tsuyako was forced to eat, eat rotten rice at a non Ainu Japanese farmer's farm from her childhood, and yet she never hated anyone and was cheerful and compassionate to everyone. Ainu and Japanese, it is only when the people who have been trampled upon forgive history and the present that dialogue and the future can be opened. First, we have to decolonize ourselves. Tsuyako taught me this through her way of life. I grew up watching Tsuyako and Nitsuko living resiliently, and my grandmother, grandfather and father, uh, non Ainu Japanese, living with warmth and great love, and they always gave me overflowing love and hope. That is why I was able to leave words out of silence, even in the face of overwhelming denial and explosion. And then I began to speak. The words and violence, the, sorry, the words and voice are still unheard by the order and structure surrounding me. However, I will continue to speak. The invisible I and its silence are post-colonial historical consequence of Hokkaido. And the mirror reflecting the social structure of Hokkaido and Japan. The silence evokes what awaits awakening and creates a word world that does not yet exist. Let's find such possibilities in the worlds born from silence. Okay, this is the last. I dream that one day the voices of silence will play an orchestra. We humans can imagine the invisible world and listen to the inaudible voices. In the past, human activity was inseparable from incomprehensible world we have now entered an era in which there is nothing that we, we do not understand with deepening of uh, science and technology, as well as the demagicalization and the ritualization of our, self, of our lives. And such now, there are many stories of silent pain excluded from structure and order and forgotten waiting to be heard. I hope that out of these silences, words will be born and that we will be able to talk to each other in these words and create a beautiful future. 
I would like to dedicate this book to all the Ainu who died in silence, unable to share the pain of their Ainu origins with anyone, to the Ainu remains that have yet to be saved, and to all the invisible people who remain alone and silent. Thank you very much for listening to my silent voices. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ishihara, for that illuminating, incredibly personal and moving presentation. Um, we are going to move into a five minute refreshment break. So we'll give you an opportunity to take a break from your computer, uh, stretch, move around a little bit. And you can also use this time to reconnect to us via chat or uh, ask a question in the Q&A uh, function, which is just sitting next to the chat button. If this will help us if you distinguish the two, just so we can move things through a little bit easier. But if you do make the error of putting a question in the chat or vice versa, I'm sure we'll figure it out. Um, but if you can keep that in mind where you're putting your Q&A, that will help us when we get there uh, later on in the presentation. So we're going to take a five minute break and we'll see you back here again in five minutes. So thank you, everyone. minutes to, to freshen up. Um, so, so before we move to the question and answer period, uh, Dr. Ishihada had asked me to um, provide a few comments or commentary based on her presentation that she gave tonight. So if uh, you indulge me for a little while while I talk about some of the things that she's brought up um, or the things that got me, what got me thinking about uh, within her presentation, and then we'll get to the questions uh, and discussion after that. So please do keep putting in questions into the Q&A and uh, discussion in the chat. So Ishi has a sense that your presentation and research is based in cultural anthropology, but you do touch on a variety of other academic disciplines and fields, including history, indigenous studies, policy and political studies, historical memory, oral history, and, and the like. But your talk and research are not merely uh, an academic muse. They're, they're actually quite, they're, they're acutely personal and touch on real world issues and challenges with real implications. Here I'm thinking about issues around personal and external recognition of identity, healing support mechanisms for historical multi historical multi-generational traumas, activism, reconciliation, decolonization processes, government related programs or recognitions, uh, related resource allegations, policy making, and laws. And you discuss so many of these challenges and issues head on. There's no beating around the bush with what you've raised tonight. Um, but many of the issues that you've raised have been taboo to discuss so openly. That your talk touches on so many disciplines and everyday practicalities, I'd like to raise a few related uh, comments and questions for you. So you've used academic discourse to discuss and put words to your lived experience and your lived silence. And I wonder why you have felt the need to use academia to explore these issues. I also wondered if you feel that academia is appropriating your history and identity, or if it is you that is appropriating and decolonizing academia, not just in a particular academic field, but as academia as an institution as well. And I have in mind the, the, the university that you work at, just as, a, just as an example, Hokkaido University. It's the university where you obtained your PhD and it's your current employer. But this institution is also wrapped up in so much about what you talked about today. And there is a little bit of irony here, I think. So the precursor to Hokkaido University was the Sapporo Agricultural College, which first opened in Tokyo in 1872. The person that was in charge of the, the kaitakshi or the, the colonial agency of, of, of Hokkaido at the time, he sent 36 Ainu to the school in Tokyo to test to see if they could be so-called civilized. After a few years, four of the Ainu died. And then the school, the government moved the school to Sapporo in 1875 and renamed it. This was just a few years after the Meiji government absorbed the whole island um, at the, at the time and renamed it Hokkaido. 
the university played a vital role in developing the land, the island, with influence from practitioners from the United States and beyond. In the work of the university, there was little room for the inclusion of Ainu. The exact opposite could be said. Faculty also perpetrated discrimination towards Ainu, often seeing them as barbaric, backward, poor laborers, and also specimens for study, whether they were alive or, as you pointed out, dead. On the one hand, Hokkaido University is iconic institution that helped play a fundamental role in the colonization of Ainu and Hokkaido, helping incorporate people, land, and resources into the formation of a new modern Japanese state, of which people from both sides of your family were a part. In one sense, Hokkaido University is a symbol of the power of imbalance within your story. And as also a symbol of the one-sided narrative of Wajin or non-Ainu development and progress of this part of Japan. On the other side, Hokkaido University is a key site for reconciliation, hope, and addressing some of the most difficult questions and issues we face today, which you have raised many. Today, the university plays a role in both the continued subjugation of Ainu through shaping the boundaries of arguments and policy, but also in supporting indigenization, reconciliation, and decolonization. The center at which you work is still relatively new. So the Center for Ainu Indigenous Studies was established in 2007. And the shape and focus and place within the university has been no doubt an interesting story. And this story has changed over the years. And from what I can see from my foggy glasses from abroad, in the midst, the, the, the center is also in the midst of a new change, and you're now part of that change. So I wonder about your reflections on this, on the university and the center and your place within it. I'd also like to say something about personal connections, because you, you, you talk about so many personal things in, in your presentation, your, your work and your family. But what's so interesting here is it's, it's deeply connected to my own. So for example, um, while I knew of Dr. Ishihara for many years, I didn't know her until a few years ago, but I have known Dr. Ishihara's father since the early 2000s, when I became a regular customer at his used bookstore in Sapporo called Sapporo Do. From my historical research at the time on Ainu and uh, Northern history, so history looking at that Hokkaido, Kuro Islands, and Sahlin, I'm going to archives, libraries, uh, interacting with community members, and visiting and uh, going to used bookstores were my go-to places. Used bookstores, such as Sapodado, became an even more important for me when I moved back to Canada, and it became more difficult for me to access materials I was otherwise looking for. So book buying when I was in Japan was, uh, had, a, had a new meaning for me. But Sapporo, your father's bookstore, was and is no ordinary used bookstore, where one can usually go in to store, browse, and possibly buy something off the shelves. This was far from my experience at Sapporo. During my first or second visit to the store, Ishihara-san, so Dr. Ishihara's father, began to inquire about what I was looking for and why. He immediately asked me to sit down and asked me to explain more. And he offered a few comments and recommendations. But then he also told me to come back in two days. Over the years, I made a habit of stopping in at his store when I was back in Sapporo. And he encouraged me to do so. And he was always asking me to give him a heads up before I came to Japan and then after I arrived and then when I might be able to visit the store. He always made time for me to sit down and talk in a store or have lunch together. He was also kind enough on many occasions to give me mini lectures, whether I asked for them or not, about this or that, be it on Okinawan history, which he, he had a deep passion for, movements of peoples uh, throughout the Ohos region, or other issues with the term indigenous, Ainu, history of Hokkaido, and the like. We spoke and exchanged ideas about minorities within colonial Japan and during the Cold War Japan. We spoke about contemporary activism and challenges. 
I look forward to my discussions uh, with Dr. Isada's father and mother. But I, was, I always had a feeling he was also checking up on me to make sure I was on a good path. So Ishihara-san also introduced me to other academics, community members, and the like, frequently making phone calls and introducing me to people and arranging meetings on my behalf. He would often go out of his way to secure some resources for me, um, but he wasn't shy to just tell me to go to a library or to buy something from him, or simply tell me to go to the library first. And if I came back still wanting the source, he would locate it, and sometimes he would buy it and then resell it to me. Other times he would give me items for free or discounted until he could locate a version that he considered good enough quality. I also witnessed on more than one occasion Ishihara-san's uh, di diplomacy in action as he dealt with other clients. And it was easy to see the clients that he thought were not on a good path. Sometimes he would ask me to sit down and browse for a while and sometimes stand and browse or come back in 30 minutes or the next day. For anyone that's visited Sapporo Do, the, in both stores that it operated, the aisles are incredibly narrow, these two aisles, which is piled with books. And so Ishiyo-san had a, a command of the space. He could remove or add chairs at, a, at an instant, stack them with books, make it really comfortable or not. He was a bit like a guardian of the archives, a guardian of used or hard to find books, opening access to some, closing doors to others, revealing some, but withholding knowledge of others. Now, I always thought this was an odd approach to doing business, which also depends on sales for making a living. But he seemed deeply concerned about the work that he was, that would be doing, that would be done with what he sold or what he shared. And I mention all this as, as Dr. Ishihara, um, while she may come from a family that was silent on Ainu, in retrospect, your, your father and your parents played such an incredibly important role in shaping discussions, in shaping research, in shaping Ainu, and not only studies that deal with Ainu, but studies that deal with Northern studies, Okinawan studies, colonial studies, and supporting so many graduate students and the next generation of scholars along the way. He was a bit of a gatekeeper of sorts. Again, there's quite a bit of irony here, which would be interesting to hear your thoughts. You also deal in your presentation and your research with so many sensitive taboo topics and gender related issues. So your talk also addressed um, many of these issues. And your father, was also acutely aware of many of these sensitivities of the field in Japan and knew how taxing it could be on those that went down the path. And he told me as such, sometimes directly, but more often indirectly. He laid the pressure on hard and was always having high expectations. He often said to me, no one else is looking into that. So do a good job. Don't make a mistake here. Keep reading. Keep investigating. But he was not the only person that mentioned such things to me in Japan. Many scholars and other people that told me, often told me that they could not do what I was doing regarding some of the subjects I was looking into, as they would likely not get a job or possibly lose their current position. I was often told that perhaps I had a chance as I am not Japanese, but then they also warned me on many occasions that going down this path could inhibit my own future. Although I'm not Ainu or indigenous for that matter, the experience of learning, researching, and writing on Ainu related history was a process and remains a process that has left a deep imprint on my being. And this imprint is something that I buried for many years. Your discussion of indigenous women reminds me of a book your father introduced me to, published by STV. I recall talking about why it was mainly women involved in the project. And he said something like, it's uh, mainly the women that speak out and stand up and go do things. And Dr. Ishihara, you're one of these women. But I think you, you importantly and necessarily some gender related realities and challenges that go beyond that publication that must be overcome. 
While each country faces such challenges, we are reminded even in recent news about the Japan Olympic Committee and the comments by former Prime Minister Modi that you addressed. As well, there is more subtle but less troubling, but no less troubling actions in everyday statements and so-called norms that present significant challenge in society, but also within academic institutions. I think we could learn a lot about how gender fits into your research, but also in more practical things, such as employment and positions within academia and beyond. After all, you mentioned that you're the first woman to be hired in your center and the first self-identifying Indigenous woman to be hired by the university. So what are the other steps that we can take to remove so-called glass ceiling? On history, you historically talk about a time period from the 1870s or so, the last 150 years. But Japan and Hokkaido of the 1870s and the Meiji era were different than eras that came later. Here I'm specifically thinking of the transition toward Imperial Japan, the Pacific War years, the post-war era, and the Cold War. In short, your story is also wrapped up in colonialism, which we often encounter in Indigenous studies, but what you speak of is also related to loss of empire, the Cold War, as Japan relinquished its annexations and colonies, minus Hokkaido and Okinawa. In its transition, it also deals with this transition of Japan to a new type of democracy and identity creation, what it means to be Japanese in the modern era, and what it means for Japan in the post-war era, including the widespread idea of a monoethnic, homogeneous Japan. For example, we could look at the change of what Japan and Japanese means and has meant over the years. The shape and borders of Japan looked much different during the 8th century compared to the 13th century, 18th century, and so on. Changed again with the incorporation of Hokkaido and Okinawa. Changed again with the addition of Taiwan, Korea, Manchukuo during the Pacific War and beyond. And the post-war era saw it shed most of these additions. Japan's approach to joining the international order after the Meiji Restoration, the war, post-war rebuilding, Cold War alliances, even the planning of post-war democracy and its post-war constitution, which focuses on the individual. This is all wrapped up in how indigeneity developed in Asia as compared to North America, Latin America, or throughout the Pacific. So it almost seems to me that you are simultaneously pushing at the standard narrative of Japan, but also creating a new space within Northern studies, um, or whatever we call Indigenous studies, that also includes Ainu and Asia and Japan. I think something, this is something that's quite a bit different than what is often termed Ainu studies. On indigeneity, you push your understanding of indigeneity from the local. Your presentation and research gets into the micro, local, and personal history of silence and pain as it's related to a component of indigeneity. It gets at important issues related to indigeneity, such as self-identity, community self-identification, and external identity recognition by both Indigenous and non-Indigenous individuals, as well as state recognition and international recognition by the likes of international organizations such as the United Nations or NGOs such as the International Work Group for Indigenous Affairs or the Asia Indigenous Peoples Project. Your, your touching on indig indigeneity gets into the, the complexity of identity, but identity is neither completely local, regional, or global, but some sort of messy mix of the three. And while issues uh, touch on a variety of academic fields, it's also connected to practices within psychology, health, policy, politics, and so on. But I wonder if you have yet looked at how these other academic and practitioner fields could be utilized to further flesh out and help us and you understand the issues you raised about struggling with identity when some parts of our identity are not explicitly inherited. You also touch on global connections. It got me thinking about connections beyond Hokkaido, but to other places and peoples around the world. Well, there have been studies that look at Ainu connections to the United Nations and the like, that is, local, in, local Ainu institutions, connections to global dialogue mechanisms. What you present is also saying that there's a 
equally important component of connections and exchanges between individuals and groups of people in different places within the same country, but also internationally, internationally indigenous. I think the situation about silence and pain resulting not only from not inheriting indigeneity or indigenous identity or culture, I think is incredibly common. Here I think about, uh, may find stories of such in Canada and elsewhere. And I'm wondering, so because your story is probably shared with so many people from around the world, I'm wondering about if you thought about expanding your work to try and connect with others that may face similar situations and histories. This could create some sort of new space. I have no idea what it would look like, but I'm sure it would be there. My last points are on policy. So bring to some issues that maybe we can try and do things on and take it, the conversation beyond academia. As I said, your, what your research and presentation is, is not merely an academic muse, but this has real implications. I can see how it's tied to politi politics, policymaking, as well as fighting for limited resources. I can see how some parties in these circles might misinterpret what you're saying as justification for diminishing government resources, obligations, or changing policies. But just as equally, and I think probably more accurately, it's also called for the need for more resources, more holistic policies, and laws that address contemporary needs, but also calls for the dire need of co-developed policies and programs, initiatives, in all sorts of sectors. It's often said that there's big discretionary between survey results of Ainu population and actual number. And this is something that you mentioned with the census and uh, with surveys. So surveys that are done through, through not the census, but other surveys, as you point out, they, ha they have Ainu figures around, fluctuates between 13,000 and 24,000. But you also mentioned, it's also common to cite numbers of 100,000. And I've seen numbers that go up, triple that as estimates. This is a point that is often raised in the literature, but it rarely expanded on um, despite the need for discussion on this. From a government and policy resource perspective, I can see how this might be frightening for some. What would happen if more people came out? And I don't mean 10 people or 20 people. What would happen if the government not only need to account for and think about policy programs and resource allocation for 20,000 people, but 100,000, 200,000, beyond? So to wrap up, your talk has likely struck a chord that sounds familiar, but has not been heard in a really long time, notably in Japan. No song has been sung or made with this chord in some time, but it has now been heard and is no longer silent. So how do you see your work in the future, um, helping others grapple with their own identities and also the politics, policies, and pain of identity? And how do you see this helping people deal with pain that you so intricately discussed? What needs to be done? So what's next? And how can we use this opportunity um, to build closer ties between Japan and Canada? So there's so much more I could say but I'm gonna stop there and uh, open up the, the floor to questions from the audience. So um, Cheyenne, could you join us please? Hi, thanks so much. Um, so Cheyenne is gonna lead us through the questions. So, so thank you and uh, we'll let you take over here. Uh, first off, I wanna say thank you again to Ishihara Sensei for being here and sharing with everyone today. Um, it is truly privileged to be able to virtually meet here together like this. Um, as there are quite a few questions, um, I am going to condense some of the questions because um, we have about 15-ish minutes. Um, so to start, uh, uh, Ishihara Sensei, uh, the first question is, uh, as you know, uh, Shigeru uh, Kayano, in their autobiography shared their experience as an Ainu who was invisible and later played an important role in making Ainu visible. 
we have also learned more about Ainu through Dr. Mark Watson's book on Tokyo Ainu and through popular culture such as the manga Golden Kamui. Um, as an Indigenous woman, how do you see your work and these other works helping motivate young Ainu to become visible and not silent? Thank you very much for our very good questions. And well, first, uh, Dr. Scott Harrison, thank you very much for the wonderful comment. Uh, I'd like to answer that, but it would take me like 30 more minutes. So I do that later. And Cheyenne, thank you very much for helping us. Yes, um, well, thank you very much for the good question. Talking, um, well, considering about invisible Ainu people who would be visible, that's really hard to answer. But um, as for me, what I have been trying to do is um, show up on the sometimes media. Like uh, I was on the documentary film by NHK, and I was on a newspaper, and I was on a local TV, and I just try to show my face and name in front of people and but in a different direction because um, there are many there are many Ainu people who who actually inherited their traditional culture in this very hard situation of the society of the nation and that that way I could not sometimes commit to myself and because I have never practiced my Ainu, the Ainu culture and it has been like more than 100 years for us. So instead, what I have been trying to do is the, um, a little different direction. I'm just wearing this Western clothes and I, because I really like Japanese kimono, Japanese kim wafku, traditional, well, it's considered traditional clothes, but it just for me, it's vintage clothes, like a Western vintage clothes. So um, I just try to be um, myself standing up there and say, I have an heritage and I respect my grandmother and I respect for our uh, culture and history, but um, I am like this and I am like others. And it's, well, what I want, to, to try to say is, well, for me as an um, former silent I know it's okay to be myself and it's okay for everybody to be themselves. And But we also want to pursue our um, forgotten history or stolen history. So that's kind of like um, accepting the negative side of the history and it's very brutal. It's really sad and hurtful um culture and history for us but it's in a way and um, being ourselves and um, also trying to study or learn or listen to that history we have we could never reached to before so that's kind of thing i'm trying to do and i think the um the recent attention to Ain culture is um basically a good thing because um this way I, I believe there are many Ainu people who feel relieved that they're having their Ainu heritage and or just simply blood. In Japanese say way, we say like, I have blood and that's not a, sometimes that just can lead to racism. So it, we might want to think about, reconsider about this uh, use of the word, but it says blood. So I think um, getting attention to the Ainu culture or just a manga, comic book, and some, of course, there are many sides that we need to criticize, have the critical thinking about this. But at the same time, I believe this made um, a lot of Ainu descendants to feel safe and feel okay to have the origin. So I think it's basically a good step, first step. Thank you so much. Um, so the second question is, in Japan, it seems many believe Ainu are only those who pursue traditional Ainu culture and life ways, as you kind of mentioned in your presentation. Um, however, for many of Ainu ancestry, there's a large distance from their Ainu culture and history like yourself. Um, how do 
how do you see the loss of Ainu language and traditional culture and being seen as Japanese or Wajin and not Ainu contribute to their silence? Can you say that again? I, I don't think yeah. that. Sorry. <laughs> um, how, how do you see um, people of Ainu descent um, not having access to Ainu language and traditional culture and being seen as Japanese and not Ainu, um, how do you think that encourages their silence? That's really hard to answer, but um, let's see. I, I think we need to discuss about this um, indigenous situation or Ainu situation. To begin with, in a way to say like, Ainu people who have been Ainu people with their greatest efforts and who have inherited and who um, who are who was saved and who have the culture or way of being. So these are the people who we need to listen to them first. But at the same time, so there are people who I who I call silent Ainu, which means uh, people who have Ainu heritage but who don't say it in the public. And until until my research, they, these people said that they just hide the background or heritage because they they are shamed or they are afraid of discrimination. And that's partially true. But my in my research, what I want to say was um, that's true. But at the same time. Even when I tried to reach the history, when I tried to culture, there were so many obstacles to reach that. And so in a way, I was here in the Hokkaido University for like more than 10 years from my graduate um, days, student. And I was there, but no one was, no one accepted my explanation even though I have a different perspective from the survey or the research. So um, yes, there. what we need to do now is as um, Dr. Harrison's mentioned in his comment, we really need to think about what happened in Hokkaido. And I saw that, well, um, um, Elisam, commented about uh, settler colonialism. And I think we are running out of time now. <laughs> so um, she mentioned about settler colonialism and we we are just at the beginning to study about this, especially in Hokkaido. And as I used to work as an English teacher before, but I have to insist this fact, but um, Japan is one of the, the most country which uh, they didn't have to study or learn or acquire English because of this um, economic um, economic um, situ situation or basically we have all the books, not all, but most of the important books in Japan, in Japanese. So this is a beginning for us to read books in English and understand what international discussion is going on. And yes, yeah, settler colonialism is just that we, we are about to read and understand. And to achieve this, I hope, um, to, I hope everybody who are interested in this issue to understand that um, Japan is the country or the society which has very different uh, structure compared to, for example, Canada, because in Canada, there are indigenous people and settlers came after. That's like, people don't doubt it. I, I don't think people say that's not true. Maybe some people would, but most of the people would understand, okay, indigenous people first and settler people came next, later. But that doesn't happen in here because um, Hokkaido, if we talk about only Hokkaido, that's true. There's a simple way, indigenous and settlers, but in history or the perspective to see the history or the society is made in the center, which is in Tokyo or the um, 
northeastern part of Japan, and that is just far away from here in Hokkaido. And they don't think that they are seller first. So we need to start to discuss about this um, Hokkaido geographical um, discussions or what's the and plus like what's the geopolitical um, discussion is going on considering about uh, this considering Japan in on the basis in East Asian uh, countries relations so this is the kind of discussions we are about to start now I'm sorry I'm not sure if I answered that question no that's actually perfect and you actually went into the next question a bit um since we're almost out of time I'll quickly just um ask do you think uh, the concept of settler colonialism is a good framework to use um, in the study of Ainu and understanding Ainu experience in Japan. Yes, and uh, because um, as I mentioned a little in my talk, but um, the word wajin is so difficult uh, to use right now because um, because I mentioned about this uh, growing exclusionism air, um, the number of people who have uh, inclusion list uh, tendencies and it's 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 really um, well what I feel is um, how many how many of Japanese people would think that they are watching you know, how many Japanese people know that word first and do they accept to be said that as a wajin or do, are they comfortable talking about settler colonialism if even they have never been to Hokkaido or Okinawa and it's as uh, Dr. Harrison mentioned in Japan, we need to, uh, we need to organize discussion about Japanese uh, identity or state making before World War or after World War. So it's, um, there's a big tradition of, over there. And now what I feel is uh, it's really hard to start uh, even to start discussing because this, um, yes, because Hokkaido is just far away from um, the center. So um, about the settler colonialism, I really want to um, start discussion in Hokkaido only. It's not about the Japanese nationwide issue first. We, let's see, okay, Hokkaido has a different history from the mainland of Japan. So let's, why don't we think about this in Hokkaido? So to begin with, so there are many difficulties even to start discussion. So I would like to have this um, connection between everybody here in the world to be, um, to get us support to have um, for us to understand what's going on. So thank you very much. And perfect. And just really quickly, last question, and that's it because we're out of time. Um, how do you see the experience of yourself and other silent I knew um, relating to experiences of maybe silent Indigenous people in Canada. Yes, um, the reason I could finish my book and the reason why I am here today is um, I think I when I go abroad, I meet uh, Indigenous people, Indigenous descendants, and they they share the pain with me. I feel when I talk my story or my research, they sometimes um, cry and said, okay, that's our story. Even though they are so um, achieved in a certain extent, certain point, still they said, okay, that's our story. And I feel that, okay, I am okay to talk about this because um, this was not a comfortable speaking in here in Hokkaido or in Japan. But when I go abroad, I feel like, I, okay, now I can breathe. I can talk about how, what I have been through and what we have been through. And okay, I see the similarities in, a, of, of course there are difference, but um, there are also similarities between us. So yes, um, this is 
like again, using English is very hard for me because I have never received in a higher education in English speaking countries. But this is the beginning for me and for maybe for people in I people for Ainu people to be more to have more connection with other indigenous people and share our stories and see what's going on and I'm sure there are many things we can learn so and yes perfect thank you so much and sorry everyone if we didn't get to your question and I'll hand it over to Scott now well <clears throat> thank you so much Cheyenne for for taking us through the questions and thank you Dr. Ishihara for uh, entertaining so many questions from the audience as well. So unfortunately, we are out of time for today. Um, but if we did not get to your question, or if you have follow-up questions or comments, uh, please do feel free to reach out to us. Um, you can reach out to the Center for Ainu Indigenous Studies, and you can find uh, Dr. Ishihara's uh, contact information there. And you can reach me at the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada. To uh, Ishihara Sensei for your um, amazing presentation and for uh, going through all these questions with us. We also owe a, a thanks to the David Lamb Center at Simon Fraser, Simon Fraser University, um, notably Doris, as well as Hokkaido University's Center for Ainu and Indigenous Studies. Thank you, Cheyenne Connell, for all your efforts in, uh, in helping out uh, today and taking us through the questions. We also have to mention that this meeting was made possible by Simon Fraser University's meeting events and conference services. So thank you, Rachel, Sandy, and Yvonne. And thank you to all the attendees for taking time out of your uh, busy schedules to join us. So thank you and goodbye.